Chapter 27 Riju wandered the perimeter of the sanctum. Her cohort dispersed amongst the ascending red velvet cakes and sparkling wine fountains, wheeled out to usher the evening to its sugar and bubble lace conclusion. Already she'd lost at least one of her vine to an eager vone, who had by now presumably found one of the dozens of vacant chambers in this empty hive of a castle. The king and queen had disappeared long ago, as the rabble began to turn chippy, with more and more tinkin, denouncing another crystal glass fatality, conjuring raucous laughter and cheers and someone inevitably bellowing off with his head and getting more howls, not less, as the night wore on. She was sure Ganondorf regretted missing the sight of his lapdog turncoats, making proper fools of themselves. But then, Zelda was too valuable an asset to allow unsecured in this crowd, even under the heavy watch that kept her only one tug of the string away. Queen Zelda, words she'd pushed so hard for since the Light Dragon's return, to the point of confrontation with Link, a memory that still felt like a contradiction in terms. She'd long envisioned the steadfast, thoughtful, terminally sincere noblewoman, more as the kingdom's resident librarian than a formal monarch, leading more with spirit than force. The transformation from her bucolic camouflage to Terence toy made her feel even more dread than the idea of accepting Ganondorf's gloating invitation in the first place, though as a marked confidant of the menace. She had little choice but to cooperate, at least if she didn't want to be quietly body-swapped with one of his favored Verena. Everything in this gaudy, self-congratulatory hall overwhelmed the kidnapped princess, from the hulking boar at her side to the harsh shadowing that washed out her pale skin and fair blonde hair. Small things, easy to ignore, if Riju could overlook their mass tally, manifests of a drowning. Half the candles had been snuffed as the music grew louder, flashes of leg and petticoats and bustles and trains blurring into a great sea across the stones so many of them, had watched splatter with blood merely a year before. The inlay where the princess's knees slid, bringing the entire kingdom to heel along with her. From her front row seat to reality's splinter, she had been sure that Link would be back in a matter of weeks, fueled with the divine intervention that always seemed to favor their preferred slant of power. This was a terrible consequence of their dereliction of duty, she surmised, a danger she'd warned them about coming home to roost. It was a costly mistake, but a temporary one. This rewrite of the world was beyond the imagination of the witness she'd been. The situation within the walls was just as dire as she'd feared, if not more so. So far removed from the center of Hyrule, with Ganondorf's forces spread thinner than he'd ever admit, she had the privilege of distance. Their lives in Gerudo Town had gone on largely the same as they always had save for the haughty Verena and residents who'd kept a close eye on her, at least before Link met his insulting and devastating demise. She could think about things like the education of the young girls, the training of sand seals, the passability of the roads and cleanliness of the water. And so she did. Approachable problems she could wrap her arms around and tackle, rather than the abstract tragedy of the woman she'd sneered at while she condemned herself to a slow, incremental death. She needed a drink, longed to escape into this madness as thoughtlessly as everyone else, lean against one of these luscious, bah, feel the slick sweat of a body freed from a clingy satin dress strain against her skin. But even the passing thought was laughable, nothing she'd entertain is more than a joke with herself. Her wits were all she had in this den of iniquity. Come with me. He spun around finding herself facing down a masked figure wearing a head-to-toe crimson glove. She hadn't spotted Ayiga since her cavalcade passed through the gates, the closest post they seemed to occupy in mass. Excuse me, she hissed. Read you, Dot. Come with me. She could have tossed the last of her frosted nut cake into the coward's mass, or screamed out for any of the Verena milling around the doors and entryways always willing to press Yiga scum under their heels. But the sincerity of his urgency pitched her off guard, made her squint just a bit, trying to match the muffled whispers pitched to one she'd heard before. The sanctum's light was so strange, with all the tiny flames refracted in the stretching mirrors, but was that a tuft of yellow hair knotted above his skull? Seizing on the glimpse of hesitation in her stare, he grabbed her hand, 
towing her through the nearest staircase arch. She traced him up the stairs to the landing above, an intimate nook off the upper corridor where the spell of surprise began to wane, her acuity roaring back with a vengeance. What in Din's steps is wrong with you? What right do you have to speak my name, you honorless, cowering traitor? She demanded, deftly retrieving a hidden knife from her thigh, flashing the gleam in the shadows. And how can you presume to lead me away from my friends and hosts, when I am a guest of the crown? Are you really stupid enough to threaten me under such protection? In the almost midnight dark of the landing, the soldier tipped his white mask up to his brow. A shaggy mess of flinty, sandstone hair fell over his steady, unmistakable eyes as blue as the Lurelin Sea. His gloved hand was fast and tight over her mouth before the shriek crested her throat. Sorry, he whispered, dropping his hands as soon as the scream was swallowed back. Link, how are you? She stammered, the wind kicked out of her lungs. They burned. The body. Of a Yiga who liked to play hero for all the girls in the valley. Riju clutched her stomach, beating back the dark laughter creeping from her trembling core. No. You're joking. I couldn't hope to think. When Ganondorf attacked, Zelda used the last of her strength to send me out of his sight. He recounted. Kara and Josha were at their lab that night, and found me flung off in the citadel before the invasion reached the castle. They were able to rescue Pai A, and we've been holed up in the Elden Sky, scouting and trying to come up with the counter plan. I shouldn't be telling anyone I'm here, even you, he admitted, a stir of regret in the creases of his voice, as if he could fold his mask back down, repossess the secret, and send them back into their respective shells. That means you've been in the castle for six months? Riju's fingers brushed her lips, her green eyes growing wide as she calculated. Does Zelda know? He shook his head, his long lashes dimming the light in his eyes as his gaze fell to the dark floor. I'm pretty sure she knows I'm alive, but not that I'm here. I can't get near her. Only the Verena are allowed up close with the king and queen. She's escorted from space to space, lock to lock. I've been waiting for the right moment to strike, just as they planned, but... There's no moment. They're all just the same. Riju shook her head, wrestling command away from the cautious women content to plot in the sky. Methodical planners, calculating ratios of success and outcomes, bared the sight of Ganondorf's smirking face and his blood-soaked hands seized around the armrests of the throne, their princess little more than a footstool to grind down even his pettiest, most insignificant prerogatives. Up in the sky, a war of attrition could be won. It was easy to tell the ground troops to stay the course. Link at. It's been a year. A year. She slid the mask down his face, locking his secret back behind the disguise as he spoke, putting him back at ease with his anonymity. It's been so long that Ganondorf is throwing anniversary parties. Time goes on, and this whole world that's been spun from your ashes. The ability for these people to remember anything about the way things were before. That deflates with every single day that his reign is left installed. All of us have been patient and careful, but we can't let this world turn permanent. You have to fight him out before it's too late. Too late for what? For any of our lives to ever go back, she pleaded. She watched Link's shoulders slump, shrinking him before, a slow deflation of all his breath. The king won't be expecting an attack, she went on in her faintest whisper, almost mouthing each word. The Gerudo will fight to the death for you. And Zelda. She pressed her palm to her heart, sealing the vow to her spirit. But we're not the only ones. You have allies in every corner of Hyrule. We've all done what we had to endure, just like Zelda. We've been biding our time and staying in line. But if given the chance and the word to root out the Demon King, we will descend on this stronghold with the wrath of our ancestors. The silence in the carved away nook hummed until Link finally asked, How long? Three days, Riju promised. My guards will ride off of the main roads into the four corners of Hyrule and let your allies know. We attack the castle at sunset on the third day. We'll have enough power to hold the castle security forces back long enough for you to hack your way through to the king and queen. Gandorf's going to be high in this farcical triumph. His footing will be off.
What about the patrols? He asked. The occupations in the towns? It was much simpler when Hyrule was locked down, waiting to choke you out. She explained. Ganondorf had enough forces to keep the four corners in line, and the roads and stables. Everyone was crammed into the same places. Now everyone is so spread out, not to mention that so many of the mines have opened again. There's wealth to guard now, not just people. It takes a formidable amount of force to cover all of Hyrule, and the cracks are growing. Link was quiet, the order's weight squeezing the breath from them both. It's not a foolproof plan, she admitted. But Link, we can't leave her here while we wait for him to paint a bigger target on his back. He will break her. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but she can't weather this forever, especially while his star continues to rise. And by the time he snuffs out her soul, none of this will matter anyway, will it? Three days, he murmured. At sunset, she drew in a deep breath, grasping his gloved fist. Three days at sunset, I vow on my mother's grave, everyone who believes in a freed Hyrule will stand against him. It's almost over, she promised, pressing a kiss to the cool whiteness of his mask. And with that she turned, flying back down the stairs to the cloak of chaos below, her green eyes glinting with daggers. The next day slogged, late rising and slow. The tangle of revelers spilled about the sanctum floor and scattered about the nearest halls and rooms scarcely noticing the noonday sun. In the afternoon the Verena began making the rounds, nudging the guests with the butts of their spears. The dragging, leery crowd with their red-shot eyes and pounding heads trickled away as horses and carriages and carts were brought back around to drag their owners back to the burgeoning estates and settlements from which they'd come. The second day belonged to the staff and the disaster of shattered cocktail glass, sticky splotches of drying dazzle fruit, wilting flowers and scuffed floors. It wasn't until the third morning after the ball that Zelda's feet battered against the staircase. Rapid, heavy steps meant to announce her imminent arrival into the dining hall. Ganondorf was already seated for breakfast, his nose buried in the same newspaper that she waved aloft as she flew across the floor. Where are Tracy and Penn? She demanded, quivering with anger only fanned by the unconcerned tranquility of the sun-drenched room, with its refreshed crystal chandeliers and all-encompassing view of the Crenell Hills. I need to speak with them, now. About? He asked, still shrouded behind the fresh unfolded paper. Abbott, what they've written about me, she said, her hands shaking as she brought the front page back before her, the tightness in her chest making it difficult to read the words aloud, emerging frenzied and choked. The queen was positively spellbinding in head-to-toe C.C. Couture, and held steadfast to her husband the entire evening. The king beamed with pride and happiness in every moment he beheld her glowing visage, stealing conspiratorial glances with his treasure throughout the night which was regrettably brief for the couple due to the noted and persistent exhaustion of Her Majesty. Although His Supreme Highness offered a touching toast to his queen with Hyrule's first vintage of dazzlefruit wine produced in 3,000 years, she was unable to partake herself. Indeed, despite Cece's legendary tailoring skills, it was impossible for anyone in the hall to disregard Zelda's newly glowing, voluptuous figure and all the joyful promise it held for the future of the kingdom. What is this, Cece trying to drum up more business for her stupid dressmaking empire? Is that why she had Tracy and Penn under her thumb all night, putting together a story that would really fly off the page, making me pose just right to come off as round? She slammed the smudged pulp into the table, freeing her hands to strangle the back of the chair. This is the same insulting, ugly gossip they were printing for years before they were granted access to everyone and everything they could ask for. Writing about the first royal ball in recent kingdom history isn't good enough without having to be sensationalized. After all these months, she had become numb to the small, almost inconsequential lies she could cite in any given issue of the Gazette. Even the sweeping rewrites of her context and history seemed, if not permissible, at least fixable, some day. That eventual, mythical day when life was was, normal, and Hyrule regained its senses. This however, was a bold-faced, clear-cut, and immediate lie. 
an expectation of what she was in absolute opposition to the truth, an expectation carrying a timeline, and a result, in its intention. A calloused hand at the head of the table reached from behind his paper to grasp a mug of coffee. Tracy and Penn wrote about your pregnancy because I told them to, and because it will be reality soon enough. The front edge of the paper flipped down and those topaz eyes ensnared her, her body frozen in calamity. As shocked as if his katana had been hurled across the pastries and fruit, impaling her faster than her eyes could behold the metallic flash. You seem startled, he noted with a smirk. That permanent, superior sneer, lapping at her astonishment, like cream from a dish. Did you think that just because precautions have been taken, that our legacy wouldn't require an heir? There was no way of stopping the ferocious blush that seeped from the apples of her cheeks to the pointed tips of her ears at his glib specificity. Yet again she was the fool, the animal slamming into walls, ignorant of the maze's design. There are still pockets of disloyalty in this realm, he went on. Such thrilling news, unveiled at the height of victory, has a remarkable power to rouse those who have embraced us, and crush the faith of the few kindling a design for our downfall. Wouldn't you agree, my dear little goddess of wisdom? She stood, paralyzed in the maw of his aims. The gnashing of muscle and fiber rang in her ears, phantoms of the gloom-laced hands snaking within her. Never enough. The great mystery of what Ganondorf wanted was the simplest answer. Everything. Beyond her life, beyond his reign. Eternity. He took his time finishing his coffee and wiping the crumbs from his hands into the linen napkin. Scraping the chair against the stone as he pushed back from the table and sauntering over to admire her bewilderment, to savor his scheming up close. That is, of course, assuming that your heart is true and belongs to me, my pet. He smoothed her unbrushed hair, that stalwart gesture that had always settled her nerves and stirred her core, now nothing but another tug at the noose. I would hate to think you'd been lying through all of this time together, making me believe that this would be anything but the pinnacle of my good girl's precious life. His thumb digging into the dull, bloody jewel at her neck, a rush of coal and grief that sent her stumbling backward. She clutched her neck, straining the fasteners and settings against her skin, bristling once again at the impossible strength with which it caged her. My king, she managed to murmur, a pantomime taking root back in her throat. After all this time, you can't possibly think such things of me. A possession took hold, the sweet puppet of herself shielding from the deadly horror pulsating within that, if allowed even a whiff of oxygen, would expose her. I'm only hurt that I'd hear this from this ridiculous newspaper and not your own lips. How could you trust a proxy with my joy? His grin sank deeper in the recesses of his face, curling his nose. A miscalculation, my pet. You'll forgive me. Of course I will, you fool. She acquiesced, tugging his beard closely for a kiss. Her panic lingered in its hiding place as her heart bludgeoned against her chest with the force of its absolute. Her time had run out. Chapter End Notes Game Set Match Darlings Prepare for some intense coming weeks as this fic reaches its final conclusion on Valentine's Day. A couple of double chapter weeks in there, because some cliffhangers are just too steep. End of chapter